So today what we have is we have uh, actually my very special friend and colleague, Lou Tucker. So Lou is our uh, CTO of OpenStack and Cloud. He's been very active in the uh, software community for a long time, so I think DevNet's pretty important to us and to him. Uh, Lou, what, can you just tell people a little bit about yourself? Sure. A little bit about uh, your background. Oh, God. <laughs> the whole background? Yeah. <laughs> I started out life as a very young child. Um, actually, many, many years ago, um, I actually started my professional career as a neurobiologist and uh, working at Cornell Medical School. And uh, I got much, we were trying to figure out how the brain sort of had neurogenic control over hypertension and mapping of brain function and things like that. Back on like a PDP 1145 with 16 kilobytes of memory. Um, I think he's done that. Yeah. So it goes <laughs> way back, but, but one of the things I got frustrated with was we were trying to figure out um, intelligence by essentially damaging the system, you know, taking looking at brain abnormalities and things like that, and switched over to computer science because I felt that it would actually be a lot more fruitful to, to build intelligence than it was, you know, try to understand it from a working system. That led to massively parallel supercomputers because we did, did not have computers capable enough of doing that. And modeling uh, 10 billion neurons was really kind of hard on the early machine. So we built a machine that had 65,000 processors. Yeah. Wow. So in many ways, what we're doing today in cloud computing is building that very, very big, scalable system. That maybe when I retire, I can go back to actually trying to solve the rest of the fire visual intelligence. But did a tour of duty through Sun Microsystems. Uh, two tours of duty, they're actually part of the early Java team. Uh, where again, we were looking at a, for developers, what was the new platform? Java, and those of you who, who actually are Java coders might know that at the time it started, it really, there was a real lack of, the world really needed a new language. We needed a new way to really be truly object oriented, to be able to create the abstractions that made it easier for developers. Right? And my, I joined when we were like 12 people, um, and it was called Oak at that time, and God's information and others. There. But we were really looking for what can we provide to the development community. So one of the first things we did at that time, first of all, we this is before open source, but I gave away all the source code just by having somebody send me a fax with, a, with an agreement. And we also discovered we were competing at that time with Microsoft. Microsoft developer programs were foremost in the field. They were essentially carpet bomb. All developers with CDs getting all of the, the Microsoft software. And we couldn't compete with, uh, with that kind of, of reach. So we turned to the web. It was the early days of actually Mosaic was just coming out then, the, the first sort of browser. And we embedded a job inside that and we used the web to communicate to developers. So it was a very early precursor to everything that we're doing today. Now when new that's, developers- That's amazing, I actually remember when like Java first came out and then yeah. we had this little course on, you know, Java in a nutshell. <laughs> that's right, that's right. One of the things, actually interesting story, is that we were trying to figure out how do you measure adoption. And so I decided the best way, if I went into you know, Palo Alto and in the bookstores, you'd see rows and rows of C programming guys, and C++, and Fortran, and COBOL. And I said, OK, we started, and there was like one little Java book. <laughs> so I started using, I had up on my wall, the, the, the you know, number of inches in bookshelves to, as a way to measure the adoption of Java. And eventually it just became the most, the largest section of the most, most of the bookstores. And then all the bookstores disappeared anyway, so it became all online. But the... Um, Did you have any idea it would become as predominant as it is today? Um, not in the first year. After the first, at, at the end of the first year, yeah, it became really obvious that as, as like a CTO, I'm always asked to like, well, predict how this going out at that point, said, well, Java started out as sort of dancing to animations on a web page, and you could program actually a web page. And I said, well, it's got to move back onto the server. Um, and the way we engineered that, we had a, a browser, a Java-based browser, that would produce HTML. We decided to essentially just run it all backwards, make it a server built in Java that could put out that HTML. Nice. And so we predicted that it was going to move back to the server, where now it's legacy. We predicted that, and we also started a Java virtual machine small enough to fit on an embedded device. And I had like a Java ring that actually ran Java on it. We had Java cards. We had Java mobile phones. And now, you know, it's almost, almost every Android phone. Nice. Today, so. 
That's amazing. It's only been about the development. So, uh, so tell me about what are your what are your job responsibilities today? Uh, making things work. It's the same as always. Actually, <laughs> um, because the technology is moving so fast, and it's a fantastic time to be writing code because you're participating. So one of the things coming into Cisco, I really wanted to do was to get Cisco much more developer centric because this is our future, and it's great to see. Devnet out here. This is the first time I think we've done this. It is the all, first time. All because of this woman. So, no, no, no. So <laughs> you get to look people. out over when this now is larger than the rest of Moscone, uh, because <laughs> it really is becoming a development company. Uh, that's what we got to look forward to. Uh, the other kind of comments I'd say is that development doesn't happen in isolation. Individual developers, you know, I actually did write the first app exchange in Salesforce up in a cabin in the woods, but that's rare. And most of the time, you were working in a community with other developers. So a lot of what we're doing with OpenStack now, there's over uh, 12 or 1,400 developers contributing to that. And, it, and it, these are developers that you may never meet. But you're on IRC with them. You're on Etherpad with them. You're putting your code up in, in GitHub and having that interaction. And that's how you create Excellent. Can you actually uh, just dive into OpenStack itself? So give people kind of. You know, what sure. are we doing with OpenStack? Sure, sure. So you may have seen in, in several of the keynotes uh, OpenStack being mentioned and referred to here and, and there. And just, so a brief you know, overview of what OpenStack is about. Um, we've all seen you know, the success of Amazon's web services and, and of Azure. Um, and we're now seeing in Google, Google App Engine and other kinds of things come out. So it's absolutely a certainty today that developing on a cloud is the best way, the fastest way to develop a deploy application. But what if you have a need to build your own cloud, a private cloud? And so what, what the community responded to, I think, and that's why we're seeing over 200 companies involved, is that OpenStack sort of set itself out to be able to provide the software to allow anybody to build, operate, and deploy their own cloud platform. And a very early design decision was made that it would be consist of a set of services. So there's a compute service called Nova. There's a network service called Neutron. Uh, there's a storage service called Swift, and another one called Seth. There's now 12 of these independent, semi-independent services that are loosely coupled. And that allows developers who are really specialists in networking to get involved in the Neutron community. Developers who are really uh, experts in, in Libvirt and how we manage virtual machines to get involved in Nova. UI designers can get involved in Horizon. These are all these different now projects which is allowing OpenStack as a platform to just grow fantastically. So, uh, so but like in the earlier stages of OpenStack, it didn't have all of them. It only had so a what few, did it, it have originally? Had a, originally, it came out of Rackspace as something called Cloud File. And this was a way for you to, similar to S3, though you know Amazon ecosystem. So like an S3 service, you can just store these things in the cloud, and they decided they were going to open the storage cloud. At the same time, Chris Kemp, another than NASA, had a, had a project which they were building their own compute service. And they decided to open source that. And so a number of us in the community, we got together, we said, why don't these things make one coherent platform? So we needed an identity service. Keystone, so that identity wasn't going to be different in every single service. So a common identity service named Keystone. Those three things came out right away, and that that sort of started as the, the basic of OpenStack platform. So I actually remember when I, uh, you know, first joined Cisco and I uh, started working with Lou. Then you were really uh, evangelizing the fact of why OpenStack is related to networking as well. Absolutely. And so really pushing kind of the neutron. You know, kind of portion yeah, be, of it. Because the first version of OpenStack had networking built into the compute service. And and a lot of, there's been other cloud platforms, and there's, there's CloudStack and there's Eucalyptus and other ones, and they tended to be built as a monolithic thing. Um, when we have the services model instead, we're looking at no thing, but if networking is built in there, all intertwined with the compute stuff, if you would have to program to the lowest common denominator. And it would be very, very difficult to have those two communities work constantly, you know, and at the same time, 
SDN was happening. Yeah, it's a, it's a so the whole networking fit, the whole idea of network virtualization, network function virtualization, software defined networking is happening. And a number of us, about 14 companies, got together. We had to go to this meeting, and we decided we needed to refactor the compute service, pulling the networking functionality out to its own service. And that at the time was called Quantum. To be the, the we were going to start small. All you basically got was a wire, you know, a simple like L2 network that you could create an isolated network and you can attach it to working machine. And the way we designed that was recognizing the heterogeneity in, in the networking space, how you how you access actually you know or manage the Cisco routers, different than Juniper and everything else. We created a plug in model. So that the bottom part of that service would allow it to, to target all these different and emerging networks. While the northbound interface that developers wrote to was create network, attach virtual machine, get me an IP address, the things that a, a developer needs to care about, not caring about how they presentation. And so that's where we've seen now a tremendous growth. There were all, I think there were like 12 open club plugins created. Cisco has, besides the open source plugins, which are Basically for Linux, Bridge, and OBS, then Cisco is the third highest ranked plugin for a Cisco network here. Yeah. And that, that does essentially a basic VLAN management. Great. That's really amazing how you've formed and pushed that whole stack. I'm not even a networking guy. So well, sure I, you are. Now I, am, now I am. I came to Cisco to learn networking. So, um, so do you think this um, combination between the compute world? In the networking world, you know, because before they were pretty separate. You had your network guys, and then you had your compute guys. Do you see more mixing going on now, or how do you see? What well, I think what brings it together is this other thing called DevOps, mm -hmm. because what we're recognizing is manually, you know, trying to manage large-scale infrastructure. The, the opex cost associated with that now is dominated by the operating cost, not the hardware. Not the software, it's actually the, the operations uh, in the IT organization. So apply software. Make make these things manageable by software, create APIs that allow you to manage all of things. And now you can start to use automation and scripts and everything else to automate the deployment of your infrastructure. So in fact now I think software is now software then applies both to the compute side and to the networking side. Yeah. So I'm actually, and I think that as a community and networking folks, we've got to really learn that, and it's not hard. It's not and hard? It's not hard. <laughs> I thought, I thought scripting, come on. If you've done any kind of shell scripting, bash, whatever, you can get rudimentary Python going. There's other things that are now using puppet scripts, again, which are designed for, it's largely for orchestration of infrastructure. So they have got the right concept there, and it, it really can be learned. So that people, in, once you notice you've done the same, you know, same path three or four or five times, spend the two hours, write it as, write it as a Python script or a Puppet module, and therefore next time you do that a hundred times, you can press the button. Excellent. So, uh, so you know, one thing is, you know, I was talking to uh, Nick Feimster, who's a, uh, he's a, a professor, of, you know, networking technologies at Georgia Tech. He's actually going to be one of our hackathon judges, you know, and he works on software defined networking. So, uh, so we were just talking about you know, networks, the evolution of the software and everything, and then he made this comment, which I always love, which is, you know, in terms of when you're operating networks, he's just like, that's right, so when you just throw software on something, no one said that that's gonna make it more reliable. Actually, that's <laughs> not true. I would take so, it, I would that's take right, so that. the question, no, that, that was generically, but okay. how can we actually make take that TCP better? Take TCPIP, what is TCPIP? It's a reliable transport on unreliable. Yep. So we've done this time and again. You can build reliability and resiliency at the higher levels through, through the software. And any of the large-scale applications that are on a cloud today, you talk about Netflix and things like that, they are designed to withstand individual failure of hardware. Because we know at any kind of scale, you're gonna, a disk drive's gonna fail. They, they, they do have a limited life span. You know that someone's gonna kick the cable out. Um, those things happen, you have to be able to design your application. So a lot of the, the, the talk in the community today is about how do you design resiliency into your application. Yep. We all know we can run zillions of copies of the application, but then how do you actually coordinate that? How do you share state? How do you manage shared state? 
And I think that's where it's going to be really important, like as we're building out a software to find networking infrastructure, that rather than reinventing all the mistakes, that we apply the best, you know, so yeah, the best exactly practices right. and DevOps and yeah. things like that. And the other thing I think that you're seeing is that I joined Cisco about three and a half years ago, and really at that time we were we were thinking long and hard about SDN and what that would mean to the business and everything else. And we finally realized that if this can be a tremendous value add for the entire industry rather than a, than a you know, you just drive to a commoditization. Because now the networking concepts are spread across the layer. And the most recent example of everything, that's ACI. So in fact, it might be better instead of having two different groups trying to deploy an application, one group that's responsible for the policy, enforcement and firewalls and everything else like that, and then you've got the apps guys who don't know anything about that. And that's why that's what makes it so long to bring up the web. If you can encapsulate policy, such as, my backend database should not be routable from the internet. I would like to have a fire, a developer can understand that. Most people on a whiteboard draw these diagrams and say, okay, there's a big cloud, which is the internet. Comes in, I want it to go through a firewall, then I want a load balancer, then my web tier, you know, my application tier. All of those things can be expressed out as policy. Yep. So again, the policies can be built by the people who are responsible, for example, the network security people, and embed their policies as contracts. That now the developer can simply say, yes, my web tier talking, you know, talking to my application tier should use web app policy signed and everything by the corporation so that they and that and they're done. Yeah. And that makes a much easier model so that we don't force all the application developers to become network programmers. Yeah. And I remember hearing uh, so our colleague Tom Edsel, who's the CTO for Insani, which is now you know ACI and APIC for our products that are running actually in those labs right behind us, he actually just you know for, for APIC, whenever you install a policy, but like whenever you start a policy for you know setting access control of something you actually also specify how to remove it, yep. you know, which is really key. Just, so, you know, just get going, make sure you know how so to remove it. You're sending somebody out to the data center to unplug something. <laughs> just software. It's just software. So, uh, so now as we're looking, and uh, you guys, in a few minutes, we'll open it up for questions. So if you have any Think questions hard. in mind, certainly get ready. <laughs> um, so, uh, so now the whole thing of a software platform is that it's a software ecosystem, right? So there's software that you know, OpenStack will write, but then now others will be inserting Absolutely. services and modules in there. So how does all that work? Yeah, so, so OpenStack really is meant to be that base platform upon which all of the other innovations and all the other businesses are going to be created. So that we'll see actually following this, you'll see one of those innovations, which is built on top of OpenStack to be able to display a lot of the streaming analytics so you really can get insights into how your data center is operating. And so that's actually a big data application that has been built to allow people to more easily understand what's going on in their open stack environment. I think we're going to see a whole raft of services now created on top of open stack. Actually, NFE is another case of that. We've virtualized, and as yesterday we were talking here, we virtualized a lot of our network services so that they can run as virtual machines. And now they can be managed. Either a tenant can bring that up out of a catalog. I would like to get you know, a Cisco router, you know, and it becomes delivered as a virtual machine that the individual tenant can manage, or we'll also be deploying this as a set of services, again, that can be called upon uh, and managed by the service provider. Because when you have a, when you have a, a router that the tenant's managing, all of a sudden you've got to think, well, I probably need two because I have to fail over. I have to establish communication between them. That's what makes it hard for tenants to deploy some network services, easy to deploy as a service provider. Who's actually going to do the testing of these systems? We all are. We okay. all are. And, and that's, that, is, that is a big issue because OpenStack in particular, it's very young. Yeah. OpenStack is about three years old. A little, it's going into its fourth year now. But it's still being used in big boy applications. Absolutely. Bloomberg's <laughs> using it. Um, we're seeing, you know, besides HP, Rackspace, some of the large cloud providers, banks are using it. And so it's really, it's going into real enterprise Mission you know, critical. Mission critical application. Uh, and again, with this model that the resiliency and the security and everything has to be built sort of throughout all layers of the stack. And we're using it as a basis for InterCloud. If you heard Rob Scott this morning, if you say OpenStack is the basis for bringing out that cloud, which will exist now in multiple partner sites, 
can you, can you dive into that technology a little bit more sure. of how uh, OpenStack and Intercloud are being used? Yeah, so it, OpenStack is the base fundamental cloud platform for InterCloud. So every data center that we are putting these different InterCloud nodes you can think of them as spread throughout the world is running a copy of OpenStack and providing the core compute, storage, and networking services for that. On top of that, then we're putting our own SaaS applications, such as WebEx, ScanSafe, and other applications, running as services on top of OpenStack. And that allows us the speed to get the market with this stuff and the agility to also and evolve that over time because the OpenStack community, every six months, we come out with a new release. Um, we're right now, by the way, they're alphabetical, so if you ever get confused, we're going through Folsom, Grizzly, Havana, Ice House, Juno is, is what we're is in development today. We don't know what K is yet. <laughs> Um, do we have any uh, questions from the audience? Yep. Ah, he's our favorite of question course, person. Of course, of course. You, you want to share? I know you struggle with things like Cisco to move the traditional CLI hero to migrate to something like software-defined networks. Yeah, so the, so the question is really, what are we doing about the, the sort of transition that people have to go through? from being, you know, real, doing heroic acts because they, they really know the arcane, you know, command CLI as we're moving that into software. Uh, there's two, two approaches that we're taking. One is that for, quote, the legacy system that we really are already out there, we will script those things and provide a, a software interface. But in the back end, what we're doing is calling CLI. The other approach is that we're natively building into iOS and everything else the core API capabilities and other things such as open daylight, which can make it even higher level of abstraction so that you can do that. So we don't want to forget the installed base out there. And so that's why we have the capabilities with API, with, with APIC, to, to talk to devices that are only managed say, by CLI. The people question is the hardest one. Um, and that's where I think that what we want to do is really approach it through the training, through CTIEs, and really much more education that we're doing more events like this. So people can actually get, you know, their skills, you know, reskilled in this new area. W one comment I might make in that, I had, uh, within Cisco, I moved a team that was working on, do I have any other guys here? I forget, maybe it was Captain K, out in Boxborough. And they were C++ programming. And I said, okay, who wants to develop OpenStack out of this team or whatever? And the 10 people who wanted to change I said, sure, I've been, I've been you know, a Cisco engineer for 20 years or so. I'd love a change. I said, great, you've got three months. Get on the web, learn Python. All the information you need is on the web. Um, there's discussion forums, there's forums, there's lots of ways you can get re retrained or whatever. And after three months, then, the, and I said, the next step is to start reviewing other people's code in the OpenStack community. So read the code. Reading code, I think, is still the best way to learn programming. And they went through that process. Now they're some of my best core developers. And so they can make, people can make that transition if you really give them the opportunity. So in your own organizations, I would really urge you to um, let people get, think out of the box, let them start to explore and, and come into this new world, I think. And they're thrilled by it. You know, first of all, they're very famous now in the OpenStack community. So that helps their resume. It makes it harder for me to retain them, perhaps. But I think that they, they're excited by that, and I think that we'll see more and more uh, in Cisco customer base moving in that kind of direction. That's great. Uh, actually, yeah, do we have another question? Thank you. Yeah, Fred has one back there. Yes, I was wondering uh, if you could explain the difference between cloud and hog technology. Sure, sure, <laughs> sure, sure, sure. sure. Um, neither one has a very good definition, of course. Um, cloud computing is what we see expressed, uh, like at Amazon and, and OpenStack, traditionally running in a data center, which you essentially virtualize the data center so you have now the ability to dynamically deploy applications. What if you want to do that in a branch router? What if you want to do that, send that notion into devices? And that's what we are beginning to think of in the notion, actually, it may have been Flavio who first started yeah. calling it fog. But it's a low-lying cloud. 
And so we're in San Francisco. We often see these coming over the hill. Um, and it's really meant applying a lot of the same principles of virtualization if the device supports it. More than anything else, it's, it's the dynamic deployment of application to another endpoint. And so a fog is then the set of devices that you can think of now as a large distributed platform that upon which you can deploy these applications. It, it's very useful in, particularly when you have a devices that generate an awful lot of data, and they can do some pre-filtering of that data just to make sure that the relevant alerts go up instead of pushing everything up to the cloud. At the end of the day, I don't think everything will be pushed up to the cloud just too much. The edge is always larger than, than the core in any kind of a graph. So what you want to be able to do is, is use all the layers possible. And so FOG is a layer that, that is a cloud-like platform that exists at the edge of the network. Will, uh, will OpenStack reach out to the to the FOG layer? Yeah, actually, we have some experiments going on. I don't know if Shannon's here where we've been putting that actually on some of like our ISR routers. Uh, I have a question about Ranger Cloud. I wanted to get your perspective on Ranger Cloud. So this is a pretty complex uh, problem, like interoperability and So is that something, so from a Cisco standpoint, is that uh, Cisco is kind of building our standards, like the way Internet evolved, TCP came along, and all those kind of standards came along. Then the similar kind of lines, motion, and the portability perspective, Hypervisor, you don't really move the, uh, the hypervisor base in terms of work from one cloud to another. If I'm in cloud in San Francisco, you don't move VMware or whatever in the hypervisor. Is there a new way of kind of looking at it from workload uh, mobility perspective? Yes. So the question is really around what are we doing of intercloud? To what extent is intercloud going to support and what magic are we performing to achieve really the kind of uh, interoperability or portability of applications from one cloud to another. There's a number of things. Uh, first is that we're running OpenStack on all of these. So the OpenStack API will be available on all of these clouds. So anybody who's writing an application to the OpenStack API will be able to run on any of these clouds. This is, this is actually an advantage of, I think, the new thinking around open source is that we perhaps can build a larger cloud, we can build the largest cloud that has interoperability of applications when they're all based on OpenStack. And because it's not a single vendor, you know, VMware or HP or IBM or whatever, we're all working together on the, on the APIs and on the implementation. That becomes a multi-vendor solution that is common across a large number of OpenStack clouds. In addition, that's actually a requirement because what happens is, for example, in certain countries, they require their cloud services to be run in that country. Right. So, but obviously we want global right. services that have global access, so uh, we we'll so need to link up these But if clouds. you're part of the rest of the ecosystem, you're now building a new service or an application, you want it to be able to run on all of these different clouds, one in Germany, one in Italy, with the same application. So at that level, we have interoperability. I think your question goes deeper. So what about something that's specifically built to a Hyper-V hypervisor, specifically built to KVM, VMware? Those probably will not have that. If you, like, like in, there is no magic in this world. I mean, if you build something very, very specific to even a particular service provider that may have a particular way of doing something, you essentially, you know, won't have the ease of moving that to some other cloud. So I think it, it's always incumbent upon application or service developers to understand what they're buying and you know what they are counting on, and to try to be programming at that level that they have that independence. We see a lot of applications, for example, moving very easily between Amazon and OpenStack. And they use things like JClouds and other software libraries that, that even allow you to access the different APIs because it's slightly different. But I think we have, it, it comes again an application, if it's an application design point for you to be interoperable, you can achieve that rather readily. Taking an old legacy app that was designed before the notion of cloud computing and everything else will require work. And I think that you're going to actually see a whole industry arise of professional services companies that will gladly work with you on mining, migrating your old application onto the new cloud box. Uh, from a portability perspective, do you think container-based mobility is available? Uh, containers have the same issue. I mean, I, I think so. 
those of you who haven't been reading the latest, there's there, between Docker and Linux containers, there's a whole other model now of having a much lighter weight sort of abstraction than a virtual machine. It can be smaller, it can be a lot more agile, you can move it around more easily, because it doesn't duplicate all of the operating systems over and over and over again. So there's more efficiency there. Um, they, they don't have the same model, they don't have the same issues. Uh, right now, we know that there's interest in PaaS, you know, which is if you look at Heroku, you look at Cloud Foundry, or OpenShift, they all have their programming models as well. And so, you, you will have to make choices. I mean, having pure interoperability, you can achieve if you program to, to the lowest common denominator, and that leaves a lot on the table. So I suggest always that people approach it as part of their application design. Build their own library interfaces that allow you to move things around and to target multi-cloud right from the beginning to achieve that. So Lou, you've taken a, you know, an interesting approach as you've been building out your OpenStack efforts, which is that you've been working with lots of interns. Mm. So you've been hiring lots of interns. Oh yeah, a lot of my, my, my children. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us yeah. about how about your approach there and how you're sure. involved so, in the work. Um, we're try only trying to get the best talent to develop. And uh, as you know, in Silicon Valley, there is a, a, a great sucking sound produced by Google and everybody else. And one of the things we thought was really being underserved was really getting some of the best talent overseas. And so we created an international internship program that allowed students to come to Cisco for a year uh, and be able to be part of this cloud you know, community that we were building here. Um, and we get some of the best and brightest. I'm happy. Uh, and you'll see some of the work just following this. So it, I think that you, we've seen it repeat itself now a couple of times. Because and the model that we have for that is, and you can probably ask them if you stick around for the next session what, how, they, how they feel about it. But then we ask them, they, they work together. So they come in, they learn together. Uh, they, we often provide housing <laughs> together. And they write code. And, and they, uh, they write code that they contribute to OpenStack as well. Exactly right. That's, all of these things, I've always thought in any of these things, you have to think about the whole sort of virtual cycle that you're creating. And whether it be cloud computing, big data, and SDN, or how we're using open source to both train the next set of engineers and have them put, in, put code back into open source that we can all take advantage of. So, so you actually talked about two types of folks. So you actually have, uh, you know, like, the folks who are who kind of pulled out of the business have been working in this stuff for 20 years, and then you the kind retread. of the retreads, the retreads, <laughs> you know, told them to like kind of gear up, spend three months, learn about Those the new languages. Those who wanted to. Those who wanted to. Motivation was the key there. I don't okay. think it would have been successful. And I think any of you who are looking to do this in the organization, I would urge you not to try to forcibly take some team that has deep expertise and say, no, you have to know it now to do this. this. If instead you ask people who want, who wants to learn something, motivation is, is really the key, and I think you'll find plenty of things. How long did it take uh, those guys to get from kind of where they were to then be able to actually contribute to OpenStack? About six months. About, about six there months. There was a couple of, so it was about three months of learning, and I told them, we're not going to ask anything of you. Go learn, you know, and teach each other, because it's also, I do also believe in doing this not one at a time, you do it as, as you see. Then three months of essentially reading code, reviewing code, participating in the community process by that without actually submitting a line, a single line of code of which you might, you know, be, you know, the community can sometimes be harsh. And so, you know, you can mine, you know, minus one something and all of a sudden you'll never go write code again. How, how, did, how did they participate in before they wrote code? They reviewed code. They read code. Part of the process in open source it really depends upon this, this review cycle that one individual might upstream a piece of code or whatever, and it has to be reviewed and open source is called plus one, saying yes, that's good, by a certain number of core experienced developers before it gets pushed into the main line. And so you go through that process. So reviewing people's code is, is doing them a great service because otherwise their code can't go upstream. So they need to have reviewers, and that way you also making friends for life. When you have your code up there, you're more likely to have, you know, a receptive audience helping you get your code into the shape. That's great. 
brain. Uh, do we have any more questions? Yes. Questions. The first is, um, have you had to struggle with the generational difference between you know, these guys around here, they are in like 25 years, and the people that have been working 25 years and not working? <laughs> it's, not, it's the no, no, guys. no, no. I mean, that's exactly the, the case. I said with this team that we had, um, that had very deep 20 years of plus experience writing networking code. Um, and because they wanted to change, I, I trusted that at that level they were mature engineers, they knew how, they knew, you know, how to write applications, they knew, they, actually not applications because they are writing networking code, more than they but they could learn. And I think that um, it's not a generational thing. Sure, I know that, you know, 20 year old probably can write more code than I can. Um, but I think that I write better code. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it, it, it comes down to a little hackathon going on over there. Lee. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's also it's also how you think about it. I think that is perhaps the harder thing. For example, a lot of people who moved to object oriented programming had a hard time. They just couldn't get going from a procedural kind of language or even like Fortran or even see going towards an object oriented program was was a bit of a bit of a challenge for some people. So there, there will be other challenges, but there's room for everybody. Just, uh, how are you integrating OpenStack with APIC APM? Sure, yeah, sorry, I should have gone over. So in the model that I mentioned around Neutron, for example, the, the bottom layer, which plugs into then many different kinds of controllers, and APIC is one of those controllers that we plug into. That's, so that's how you can use traditional Create network, launch VM on top of on top of APIC, have APIC manage the infrastructure. The second way is that in OpenStack itself, along with like nine other uh, companies, including IBM, Grand Hat, and others, we're introduced the notion of a group policy API. So now the developers themselves can start to use the policy-driven concepts, such as create a policy, put this thing into the policy, make an end group call your web tier to which you want to apply the policy, making those available with straight software, software only solutions that'll talk to you know different plugins that will work with OBS, will work with many different solutions below it. At which then our own hardware infrastructure is the one that we feel will give you the most security, most performance in most scale. And I guess one PK is also there. One PK you do yeah. also yeah, one BK though is, is is a lower level a, a, API, and so yeah, the plugin can be written that we've written plugins for example, Open Daylight, and expect the controllers to be able to talk into the lower level functions. There's always a debate in, in the OpenStack community and in, in the new front, how much functionality should we put in the Neutron control, the Neutron service itself, versus pushing the, the implementation down to lower levels. I think that we keep coming back to the notion that Neutron as a service should deal with abstraction, a network, or a policy, or an endpoint. Those are the primary abstractions. When you get down to how does that actually implement, we should push that out to another service at another layer. And that could be, you know, Open Daylight, or APIC, 1PK, whatever. Do you have any other comments about how uh, Open Daylight and Open Stack would relate? Yeah, they're, they're very directly. It's interesting to see. I think that um, when when we're looking at the whole realm of SDN controllers and a lot of different companies that are, like I said, there are twelve different Open Stack, Open Flow controllers in the front itself. Uh, we felt there was a real need to do the same thing there as we were doing in Open Stack. Is that we got together with a number of different companies. We said, let's create Open Daylight as a, as a open source project contributed to by a large number of companies. And they're on the same kind of a ramp now, having a large number of contributions, large number of companies contributing to that. In, in many ways, I think it's, it's a change in the industry. Um, I'm from the East Coast, Boston, originally, and where there was, you know, DAC and, and other companies. And we were all, we never worked with each other. I mean, fiercely competitive. Uh, secretive, and I think we're finding today that that just hurts our customers. And it's much better for our company. Our customers do not want to be locked into a single vendor. They want the very best that the industry can produce for them. 
Um, and so in many ways, we're now responding to that need by saying, let's get together on some of these core things, such as a cloud platform or, or a controller. Let's work together on those things so we all can benefit and we'll get the best, best results for the industry. That's great. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Oh, yep. Let's come on up to the mic. So with the neutron uh, component that uh, Cisco is developing basically, how, um, how can it can, can be used with container-based uh, like Docker in the network address of the container-based model? Um, do we have somebody agree? Have you looked at how our neutron plugins would work with containers? So they get that microphone. I have the experts right here. So. <laughs> That's a good question. Actually, during the summit, which just happened last week, uh, one of the hot topics was about uh, Docker. Uh, there are two integrations. One is going to be to the compute part. So the first driver that we are trying to develop is for the, for the compute part. Once uh, we have the, the compute driver in, which is not easy, which is a lot of transition and a lot of discussion on that, that uh, we're going to move to the, to the networking part. So. It's, uh, it's, I, I, will, I will assume it's going to take six months, which uh, is going to drive us to the next uh, uh, summit, K release, to actually have a Docker uh, knocking the networking uh, uh, component, the neutral part. So it's a work, work in progress. Uh, right now, of course, they can all share the thing. If, if they're all your containers, it's fine. So, uh, so another, uh, you know, maybe a last question, unless the audience has more, is uh, so here we have the DevNet audience. So we're actually, you know, kind of our first time catalyzing at a larger scale the Cisco developer community. Uh, what call to action do you have for them, or what would you like to see them do going forward, both here as well as after after Cisco Live? Actually, maybe uh, I'm going to give a call to action to the companies here and how they're looking at developers. I think developers are doing the right thing. And, and what we want to change is there's so much of this changing in terms of the tools that developers need, continuous integration, continuous deployment, all of these things that really will, we've, we've got to like give developers some flack here so that they can actually come up to speed on the latest tool. If we, if we keep just shoving sort of yesterday's requirements, you know, back in the developers, they will never, never progress. And, and the companies will not get the benefit. So I've, I've always been a big believer of, of allowing my developers to have a certain latitude in experimenting on things and learning new things and always coming back and saying there's a better way. And so I think that's what we, I'd really like to, to ask of the companies that are employing developers. In order to do that. Or they'll leave your company. I mean, so there's, developers have a real mobility today uh, in this environment and um, it's a very, very competitive market. So I think that treat your developers well. Um, and to do that, do they have to start net new product efforts or just evolve them to you know, kind of be refactored to use the new tools and code? I, I, you approach it almost on a project by project basis. When you're, when you're starting a new project, I think that's an ideal time to say, okay, now how would we deliver this product in half the time with twice the, the, the quality, uh, a lot more uh, user-centric, customer-centric, user experience, and we've talked about it many times before, <laughs> is critical in this. And that requires different thinking and development. So take the next project you're going to do and do it in a different way. OK, my favorite topic then, since you started it. So tell us more about user experience together with the network, with OpenStack, with computing, with software. Huh. Um, it, it's, I think that you know the managing tool, the tools that face the users have to be a lot, lot better, and the and the models have to be better. So, for example, Meraki is a better model because they move the application, the management application, to the cloud, so that the the of course the system administration people now have a better tool that they can use. Um, so that's important. I think in some of the lower levels of the implementation and everything else. Um, it's not the user experience that matters, it's the developer experience. What is it like for a developer to have new capabilities? If they can really quickly use a lot, reuse an awful lot of code, 
we use a bunch of modules that have been developed to get that new functionality out. That's a much better developer. Great. All right. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much, Lou. I think uh, we're very lucky to have you know someone of Lou's caliber and with his great experience <laughs> and his continued contributions throughout his career and in the industry. So thank you very much, Lou. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody.